Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I know we're joining from all over, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. If you haven't already, please uh, put where you are joining us from in the chat. We're gonna hold on a minute. The screen is not advancing, so let me share this one more time. Try it again. Okay, now we're advancing, wonderful. Okay, this is the agenda for today. This is, we have opening remarks and then we'll have our wonderful presentation and the Q&A session. So pretty simple and straightforward today. I'm your official opening remarks. So hello everyone, I'm Don Nagy. I have met many of you, but for those um, I haven't, my name, like I said, is Don Nagy. I'm the Director of Strategic Advancement and Communications here at the World Federation of Youth Clubs, and we are so excited to have you with us today. As you know, I think everybody here looks like is one of our uh, member organizations, but if you're not, just so you know, our mission is certainly to develop, advance, and enhance um, youth clubs around the world. So we are thrilled to be able to bring all of you together. Um, we did want to remind you of just some of the resources you have available. Obviously, the webcast, this one that we're on right now, is one of our um, resources that we have on a monthly basis. Um, you've also got access to our wonderful uh, mission advancement advisors that give one-on-one -on -one consultation. Obviously, we have a network of collaborators for good. These are great um, youth development uh, leaders that we can pull their am amazing resources and knowledge from. So if you have needs or questions from one of them, someone like Big Brothers, Big Sisters of um, America, um, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Special Olympics. So um, we're thrilled to be able to have that network for you to benefit from as well. Um, we have our annual conference and we'll talk about that a little bit um, again at the end, but that is coming up. March 1st. So if you haven't already registered for that, we hope you will do so. That is a three-day conference um, designed to bring a bunch of wonderful informational uh, sessions, inspirational speakers for you, and really um, bring the whole network together to learn and share. Um, we also have the Global Recognition Program, our Promise Awards, which I know some of you participated in last year um, and will be launching again um, just after the conference starting in April. So please be on the lookout for that. You all should have received, hopefully if you're on our um, mailing list, you received our monthly newsletter yesterday. And obviously we have a lot more resources being developed. So we just wanna remind you that there's so much for you um, to, to reach out to for resources and to learn from. So by all means, reach out to the team um, if you're not participating in any of the things that we've just listed because we'd love to have you involved. Um, I wanted to do a quick bit of housekeeping just so that you'll know kind of what um, the best viewing is for this session. So a note, you all should have seen that we are recording this. This will be um, put on our YouTube page and available for you to either view again or share with um, your colleagues. So that will be available after this session. We will send that link. You are currently muted um, until we get to the Q&A. Please feel free to put um, questions in the chat as we go along. Our wonderful presenter today, Sylvia, is certainly um, open to us, you know, kind of asking questions as we go if need be. And then for best viewing today, um, you can just go up to the kind of right hand top of your screen and click view and then speaker view just because that will um, give you the best possible viewing for um, this particular session. So with that, we always try to get everybody a little bit involved and connected here to make sure that you know um, where the chat function is. And so I'm curious um, because the Olympics are starting, gosh, I don't know, Sylvia, it's probably just another week or two, right? And so we thought um, it would be great to get a chat check-in done today about what is your favorite winter Olympic sport. Um, so if you can go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, I'm curious, Sylvia, do you have one? I have one skiing for sure. I'm a big, uh, figure skating fan and some of the downhill skiing is pretty impressive as well.
Anybody else have a special sport? Uh huh. Here's Glenn's definitely downhill skiing, ice skating, obviously. Soccer. Do we do soccer as a winter sport? I don't know, but I agree. It's a great one for us to be watching. So thank you so much for, please continue to put your favorite sports in there. Um, but now hopefully everyone knows where the chat is um, and please feel free to use it throughout the session. So um, with that, my slides are not advancing again. Well, the dog is barking. Let's try this one more time. Well, one more time here. It is really thinking about it. My computer has had some issues today. Um, so I appreciate your patience. Here we go. We may have to go through them again, but we'll get that going. Okay. Here we go. Wonderful. Can every Sylvia, can you see yourself here on the screen? I can. Wonderful. Well, I want to take just a minute um, to have to introduce Sylvia. We're so thrilled that she's with us today. She's originally from Holland. Um, and then moved to Canada, where uh, she learned French and English as her second and third languages. And she's joining us today from Mexico, which is her current home. Um, she spent the last 30 years in, the, uh, in senior management in the social service sector. Um, so we're thrilled to have her today. Her last um, full-time senior leadership position was with Boys and Girls Clubs of South Coast. And she is now a consultant with CARF International um, preparing organizations for accreditation, which I don't know. I I worked Sylvia with a group while we were going through accreditation, um, and it's quite the process. And so, um, if there's anybody who's super knowledgeable about this subject of making health and safety a priority, um, it is Sylvia. She's also president of the board of directors of the Club de Niños y Niñas uh, in Baja California, sir. So let uh, please join me in welcoming Sylvia to tell us more um, about health and safety, which is such a, a important priority as we get started in the new year. Thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, I wish I was there. We were all in one room in person. We could shake hands and, and chat, but uh, here it is uh, using video and it's, it's a, a great option. So let's start. Um, First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that the World Federation of Youth Clubs is committed to providing support and guidance to all members of the organization in the area of health and safety. The goal here is to ensure that all partner entities have the ability and the information they need to provide healthy, clean, and safe environments. I always refer to a club as a home away from home. A safe environment, of course, means safety within all the service locations, as well as potential harm that they may come to in, you know, in the streets and unfortunately even in their homes. And I mean this for youth, participants, uh, and staff, you know, any, anybody else that's uh, in and around your, your location, your work location, can provide quality programs and services while minimizing any potential risk to their participants, to their employees, to their volunteers, to visitors, and even the community at large. Another important objective related to the very existence of any of our clubs is to reduce whenever and wherever possible any potential dangers regarding liability. Even the best insurance, including director's liability and insurance will not entirely 
stand up to neglect. The should have, could have, would have, but didn't scenario is what you wanted to avoid. The physical environment of a club usually provides immediate evidence of your ongoing attention to safe practices, reduction of health and safety risks, and an overall concern for the health and safety of everyone. In other words, what I mean here is the moment you walk into a club and you look around, you usually know the evidence is in the cleanliness, in emergency equipment like fire extinguishers, uh, supplies like first aid kits, signage like exit signs, and also very important attitude. Some of the information you're going to move, in other words, certain things will come up again and again in different areas of the presentation. And why? Because they're important and they shouldn't be dismissed or forgotten. Clubs that do the very best in this important area are usually those that have an active health and safety committee. The health and safety committee is ideally made up of a combination of leadership and direct service staff members. The committee can take on many, if not most of the tasks and duties and responsibilities I'll be sharing with you. I'm hearing something is, is are people able to hear me okay? I think so, Sylvia. And some of you are frozen, so I'm just wondering, can everyone hear me okay, Don? We can hear you. You've, you've cut up a little bit, but we can hear you for sure. Yeah, we hear you fine. Okay, I'll continue then. So the health and safety committees can vary in size, depending of course on the size and the number of locations you operate in. If you have more than one location, it's really a good idea to have at least one member on your committee who works at and can represent that location. And committees should meet at least monthly and all the proceedings of each meeting, and this is important, they should be documented. Let's just talk about some general health and safety factors to consider. First of all, each organization and their related government authorities often determine many of our health and safety requirements. And that's on country, on region, on local norms, issues in the area, and of course your practices and culture. If we achieve best practice in the area of health and safety as a base, we need to fully implement, of course, the authorized mandated requirements and then ensure that we also have the following. And this is important. We need written policies and procedures that promote health and safety in our club for our participants and for our employees. And I say written because if it's not in writing, in reality, doesn't exist. We should have ongoing general education for staff members and our participants to minimize any potential dangers. I'm talking about emergency preparedness. I'm talking about universal sanitation precautions, crime prevention, self-defense, nonviolent crisis intervention. In other words, all current general health and safety practices, as well as how to effectively reduce and uh, any or any potential uh, physical risks. But more important than that, we need to take providing general education on these issues to the next level. We need to provide what we call competency-based training for all our personnel and regular volunteers, just general education. And what I mean by that is competency-based training means that we have to have evidence or proof that the person who took the training, whether they attended a workshop, a conference, or a webinar, actually learned what they were supposed to learn to the extent that they can use the training effectively when needed. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a conference myself or to a workshop and kind of spent some time on the phone and maybe took a bathroom visit that lasted a little too long and, and missed a lot. And, and this is what we want to avoid. We want to make sure that everybody's really getting everything they need from the training they're taking. 
And the training, this competency-based training should be provided at least at orientation and annually. So let's go to slide um, that says competency-based training and we'll go through what's included and what I mean by that. So here we've got a list of what's included in annual competency-based training. First of all, health and safety practices that reduce physical pain uh, more than anything. First aid training can be provided annually or can be reviewed annually, but usually if it's certified, it's, you know, once every two years, once every four years, depending on, you know, the location and the requirements in your area. Second of all, the identification of unsafe environmental factors. And what do I mean here? I'm talking about neighborhoods are they industrial are they residential are they commercial is crime an issue is air quality an issue traffic railroad what about wildlife so all kinds of things vary greatly depending where you are emergency procedures is the next one here i mean drills or some people call them tests what do we do if something serious happens who do we contact who do we report to Number four is evacuation procedures. And here I'm talking about where do we go if we have to leave the building? How do we know that everyone's out of the building? When is it safe to go back in? And what are we, what are we learning from this procedure? What do we need to do to make it better the next time around? Number five is, is identification and reporting of critical incidents. And here it's what exactly should we consider a critical incident? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. What needs to be reported and to who? Medication management doesn't apply to everybody, but if you do not administer medication in your workplace uh, to the people you serve, then you should still know who's taking what and what to do if any complications should occur. We're talking about overdose or maybe not enough medication or allergies. Number seven, workplace violence. Something unfortunately that's perhaps on the increase all over the world. Um, making sure that everyone at least has nonviolent crisis intervention training is a good thing to do. It's a good first step. But also let's identify what are the next steps if that is not enough, not effective. Number eight is reducing physical risks. We're talking about trip hazards, fall hazards, um, just making sure that your physical location is safe, as safe as can be for everyone. Working alone, uh, that's, that's an issue in a lot of organizations. We need to make sure that people have Communication devices, they know who to contact and who to report to, who to check in with, who knows where you are. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be a real issue working alone, in the, especially in the community or even in your own location. Bullying and or intimidation. Uh, yes, very important to follow up when that happens in the workplace, but Take it a little further. What about the root cause? Why is it happening? Is counseling required? And of course, what are the consequences of these kinds of behaviors? Make sure that we really define that because it's a gray area a lot of the time. You really need to understand what do you mean by sexual harassment? What does that actually look like? And then how do we follow up? Uh, uh, counseling, of course, uh, is important to have access to, but also what are the... Was that a question? I think that was just someone kind of on, uh, not muted. I think we're, I think we're okay. Okay. All right. All All right. right. People, you certainly, good. yeah, add it in the chat or raise your hand if you do. Go ahead, Sylvia. Okay. So number 13 is, of course, possession of weapons. How do we respond? What are the local laws? Who do we contact if that's an issue in your organization? Uh, mental health issues on the increase 
for sure. We're hearing about the mental health concerns that uh, are being shown in, in especially children and youth these days. We're talking about depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, uh, definitely on the increase everywhere. And any other that might be relevant, you know, to your local needs, of course. So to go on, uh, to make sure that your training is effective, uh, some competency-based ways to provide evidence that the students actually learned what they need to know, that they really understood and that they'll remember, and some things that clubs could consider using is first of all, ongoing orientation and education session, the training. Uh, regularly scheduled to allow for discussion, for uh, to provide information, to answer questions, identify your needs, concerns. Post tests, um, absolutely. After every session, there should be some way of asking written or oral questions. Um, right after the training is the best way to do that. Tabletop exercises. What do I mean by that? Um, staff team can meet in a conference room and just discuss their responsibilities and how they should best react to an emergency situation. Uh, Walkthrough drills are a little more thorough than a tabletop exercise. Um, you can do this by actually just walking through uh, what you would do in what you know you're actually performing an emergency response and and then of course there's the full scale exercise a real life emergency situation that's fully stimulus uh, simulated and involves everyone on the premises these are the drills that you know that we should be doing on a regular basis now i don't know where any of you fit when it comes to best practice related to health and safety some of you may already be doing everything that I'm sharing with you today. Some of you may be close and others may be far away. But remember that when we're talking about best practice in this area, we're talking about what you really need is a plan. A plan is basically to determine where you are on the road to best practice, to determine where you want to be, and then start the process to achieve best practice and maintain best practice one step at a time. Let's talk a little bit about a health and safety training plan. It should be developed and should include, like uh, maybe we can put up health and safety training plan. Okay, great. So it's like any other plan that you might have in your club, it should be in writing, first of all. It should include goals and objectives, actions to be taken, indicators of success, the person responsible, and a timeline. And let's just look at what we've written up here on the, on the screen. It's who will be trained should be in the plan, when the training will take place, who will do the training, of course, what training activities will be used, how the session will be evaluated, uh, satisfaction surveys for participants is a good way to do this. How will the session be documented? Will there be minutes taken? Will it be recorded? A review of each training session after the fact, and of course, a thorough evaluation or analysis is maybe a better word of each training session. Was it effective? Did it? And will it make a difference? And in, a in addition to training on health and safety in the office setting, it's also important to provide training on an ongoing basis regarding any potential risks involved while working in the community or in a person's home. So if you're in the park for a community, if you're um, you know, in someone's backyard for an event or anywhere, uh, this training should include the identification, of course, of any potential risks ways to prevent risks and what the emergency procedures should be to deal with any potential and dangerous risks. So don't, you know, take it outside of your location, take it into the community or anywhere else that you might be at a ballpark or wherever. 
And again, remember to include the following in your training. And here's where I may get a little bit repetitive, but it's important. The identification of individual roles and responsibilities, information about threats, hazards, relevant protective actions to be taken, notifications, warnings, and communication procedures, ways to locate family members in, a, in an emergency, so have that information readily available, uh, and shelter, accountability procedures, like I, me I mentioned before, who's in the building at any given time. This is so important. I can't tell you how many times I've seen where uh, an incident has been written up and a drill was done and someone had an anxiety attack and um, they hid and nobody realized until way after the fact that they were hiding in a washroom or hiding in a closet. So it's important to really understand and know who's in your building at any given time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, emergency shutdown procedures is another one. Um, example, should you move to another location? Uh, is virtual an option or do we completely shut down? If you want, please, um, written emergency procedures is the next slide. And we can talk through that while it's up. Oh, there's some good ones. Flooding, a lot of that happening these days. And of course, fires. So each club should have written emergency procedures. And these can be handbooks, manuals, posters on the walls even. They should be appropriate, of course, for each location, and they should include the requirements of applicable authorities and what to do for at least the following. For fires, uh, your procedures here would include drills, suppression techniques like fire extinguishers, notification systems like a siren or a loudspeaker, and of course, evacuation in the case of a fire. Number two is bomb threats. Here again, drills, uh, notification, evacuation. Natural disasters are different for everyone. Uh, they can include hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, other extreme weather, forest fires fit into this. Uh, something certainly that we're dealing with in the U.S. with all the storms in the Northeast and we deal with it and the weather is certainly a big factor nowadays. Changes in weather. Uh, utility failures is the next one I'm talking about. Maybe we should make sure we have generators on hand, battery operated lighting, cell phones, supplies, emergency supplies, uh, medical emergencies. We should have written procedures about that for sure. This includes first aid response and access to first aid. We're talking about falls, cardiac events, loss of consciousness, medication issues, choking, poisoning, drowning, allergic reactions. There's so many, I, I could you know, write a page full. Uh, the last one here is violent or other threatening situations. And I'm talking about Again, something relevant um, in the US, active shooter. It could be explosions, gas leaks, any aggression, assault, including physical bullying and intimidation, or, or of course, sexual assault fits in there too. There's a long list. And these procedures should include clear directions regarding complete evacuation of the building, and that's also where to gather when you're outside of the building. Everyone should have a muster station, they call it, you know, a place outside, a safe place where everybody gathers and can be accounted for. What to do and what to have available when sheltering in place. Um, you need a safe room, especially in the area, you know, in, in the case of a tornado or something like that, extreme weather, uh, yet a generator system if possible, certainly flashlights, cell phones, water, food, blankets, first aid kits, medicine, etc. Accounting for all people involved. I know I mentioned that before, but it is important to me because I've run into 
some really serious situations there, a good way to do that is have a sign in at reception so that everybody is accounted for when they come into your building. Because how do you know who's hiding at any given time? I mentioned anxiety and it comes up all the time. A lot of you may have people with autism and, and that's certainly something they do. They cover their faces, they run and they hide. And uh, if they're not accounted for, it may be too late by the time you realize they're missing. Temporary shelters, if that's applicable in your area, um, you can't return you know, to your original site. Or if you can't go home, if you have to shelter in place, um, make sure you have the emergency supplies that you need to do that. Make sure that you have accessible emergency phone numbers and the information uh, that you need readily available, easy to access, maybe a plastic, um, you know, a, a folder or a sheet, plasticized sheet on the wall that lists the fire department, the poison control center, the police, etc. Because in the case of an emergency, it's amazing how many people can even forget 911 if that's the number you use for, you know, an emergency in your locations. Uh, the accessible phone numbers, emergency phone numbers and information on, on all of your, your staff and notification of who to call and who to report to, um, including emergency authorities and your supervisors. Like, what do you do? Uh, who do you involve? Uh, who needs to be called? Which supervisor? Which authority? Each club should also have, this is something else, evacuation routes for each location that are understandable, easy to see, easy to access. For example, uh, you could have diagrams up on your walls that show where the evacuation routes are. Maybe they need to be in Braille or in different languages to, you know, to uh, uh, be, you know, uh, really, accessible to the people that you're serving. Maybe they need to be pictures, maybe language is, is not enough. Uh, directional signage and lighting, uh, I'm also talking about in this area. So your evacuation routes have to be clear and obvious to everyone walking into the building, even for the first time. Maybe a visitor who doesn't know the building, they should be easily available uh, and lit and understandable. Each club must also conduct um, fully documented, unannounced emergency drills. These are the dr drills you don't tell anybody about, except maybe your health and safety committee. And they should be done on every shift, if you have shifts in your workplace, and definitely at every location. And also for every emergency procedure, because they are different. Uh, you know, you collect in the muster station for a fire, but if it's a tornado, then you have to shelter in place. And how do you do that? Let's practice. Do it at least annually for every single emergency, possible emergency in your area. And that, that might sound like a lot in a lot of areas, but it's, it's definitely worth the trouble. Can we see slide number three, the written emergency procedures? Uh, here it is, sorry. There it is, there it is. Okay, so written emergency procedures, um, it, we're going back to just a reminder of what they are. And of course, there are fires, bomb threats, natural disasters, utility failures, medical emergencies, violent or other threatening situations. These are the things you should actually be practicing in your unannounced emergency drill. Okay, all of these should be practiced. I think they apply to just about everybody. So also very important that when you do any of these procedures that you actually do a written analysis. It sounds like a lot of work and that's where I'm gonna just go back and remind you that if you have that health and safety committee, that's usually all of their responsibility. So. Uh, it is a lot of work, but it can be shared, uh, it can be delegated. So a written analysis must be performed that addresses the areas needing improvement, 
the actions to be taken to address any identified improvements needed, and the evidence of implementation of accidents, any necessary training or education, and results that indicate success of actions taken. So we really want to know that not only have we written up an analysis, but we figured out how to make it better and how to improve anything that required an action or required an improvement in any way. A reminder here, that this is applicable if your location is owned, donated, shared, leased by the club. It doesn't matter, even if you share the location with another organization, these things are important to do. You can collaborate with the other organization or you just do it on your own. You're responsible for your people. Hopefully it's a collaborative effort. Um, also a reminder that sometimes these unannounced drills can be tabletop. And I mentioned before, I use autism as an example. Sometimes a drill or a siren that goes off or a very loud message on a loudspeaker can really rise the anxiety level of certain people, of certain individuals. And that, that, that needs to be taken into account. So often in, when you have a population like that that you're serving, your drills can be tabletop from time to time, uh, which means you just get around a table and you walk through you know, what you would do how you would do it. They're never as effective as the real thing, but it's better than nothing. So let's talk now about what each club must provide easy access to in every location. First of all, first aid expertise is very important. Uh, first aid expertise is usually certified. Uh, it includes CPR and also it should include responses to any medication issues, side effects or overdose. Um, it's really important to have at least one person on site who is first aid trained anytime that you're providing services to your clients. First aid supplies, of course, also very important. Now, first aid kits, um, usually everybody has them. One thing I'd like to just remind people of that it's important not to leave medication of any kind in a first aid kit. Seen lots of instances where medication has been misused, you know, stolen to be misused, and uh, it's a good idea not to have any medication of any kind. And I'm even talking about Tylenol, uh, something that people often don't think about. Uh, and also the first aid kit should be regularly updated. You don't want you know, something to happen, somebody to use all the bandages, and then next time it needs to be used, you're missing a few things. Also relevant information on all the personnel and participants, uh, easy access to that. I mentioned that before, but it is important. You should have a file on everyone, including your personnel and everyone that you serve about who their doctor contact information is, do they have any allergies or medical conditions, are they on any medication, uh, are they using any assistive devices, um, who do you contact if there's an emergency next of kin or whoever that is. It should be on file, somewhere easily accessible. We talk about critical incidents and um, Maybe this is the next slide. Yeah, great. You're way ahead of me, Don. Uh, what is a critical incident? Now, people sometimes call them a serious incident, a special incident, a reportable incident. There's usually a requirement to report these either to your funders, to you know, the leadership, to your board of directors in, you know, in an annual meeting or just uh, or in a regular board meeting. What and it's important to really understand, well, what is a critical incident? What do you consider a critical incident in your, in your club? So here's some examples. Certainly a medication error, if you're administering medication, would be a, a serious uh, critical incident. Uh, an allergic reaction. Reporting in progress. And 
use of seclusion and restraint. Now, many clubs have a policy that says we don't ever use seclusion and restraint, but I wanna remind you that there's always an exception and that exception is when someone is in imminent danger to themselves or others. You're certainly not going to re not restrain someone if they're ready to jump off a building, run into traffic or hurt somebody else. So there needs to be definite a definite definition in your club of, of how you would respond to that. Any incidents involving injuries are considered a critical incidence. Any reporting of a communicable disease in your you know, location or nearby would be a reportable. Infection control issues, very relevant nowadays. Any aggression or violence, uh, use of possession of authorized wep unauthorized weapons, uh, wandering um, or el elopement. By that I mean, you know, someone who's gone missing. If you're on an outing or uh, and all of a sudden you, you know, uh, one of your participants is is not not there. That's considered a wandering or an elopement, uh, a vehicle accident. Uh, biohazardous accident, and um, we talk a little bit about what that is a little later, uh, an unauthorized use of le uh, legal or illegal substances, abuse, neglect, um, declared suicide ideation is considered a critical incident when somebody actually talks to you and tells you what they're thinking in regards to suicide, or of course an attempted suicide of anything, anything like that, sexual assault, overdose, and, and there, there could be others. I always leave that open. Um, so make sure that you identify anything that you consider a critical incident in your area. Sylvia, Each... I want to just, Sylvia, I just want to note real quick, we're at 15 minutes left. Okay. All right. I'll talk really fast. How's that? It's, I mean, it's Each a great, club... yeah, there's great stuff, so. Okay. Each club should have written policies and procedures regarding all of these critical incidences, um, a description of what is considered to be a critical incidence, prevention, reporting, documentation, remedial action, and of course, timely debriefs with everyone, especially traumatized individuals. A written analysis should be conducted at least annually. Uh, this, these are all things that can be done by your health and safety committee. The written analysis should include causes and trends, areas needing improvement, actions to be taken, timeline, whether or not the actions address the improvements, necessary training and education, and of course, any internal and external reporting requirements like to the licensing bodies, to government, uh, parent organizations, et cetera. Each club should also have written policies and procedures on infection control. And again, I'm talking about you know, training, prevention, reporting, investigation. Um, we're talking about infection control and prevention of communicable diseases. Very, very relevant now with COVID being such an issue. Uh, transportation of people we serve. The next slide. If your organization provides transportation for any of your clients, either transporting them to a ballpark or anything like that, or picking them up from home, driving them home. It's really, really important that you have appropriate licensing of all of your drivers. I'm saying if this is a larger vehicle than normal and you need a different license, uh, regular reviews of driving records, appropriate insurance, safety features and equipment. I'm talking about booster seats, flashlights, tripods, signage, seat belts, all that stuff. Accessibility, uh, for, especially for people that are disabled in any way. Driver training over and above the regular for challenging behaviors. Um, who to call, written procedures, you know, written emergency information and procedures, meaning who to call. Uh, communication devices, first aid supplies, and of course, regular maintenance uh, in accordance usually with the manufacturer's recommendations. Let's go on to slide number six now. We're talking about self-inspections. And these again are something that can be done at least semi-annually and they can be done by your health and safety committee. And here are some of the things that you need to inspect on a regular basis. 
heating and cooling systems, electrical systems, walking and working surfaces, food preparation related to eating areas, food storage, restrooms, uh, structural integrity, storage of hazardous materials, fire protection system and equipment, air contamination and ventilation, recreation and visitation areas, evacuation routes. These can all be done as self-inspections on a regular basis. Also, we need to have what we call external safety inspections, and that's the next slide. Here's where we have the specialists come in, qualified authorities like the fire department, uh, the registered safety engineer, um, or representative of an insurance carrier even, and here are the things that you need to make sure that they inspect. Um, again, the list is there, warning devices, walking and working surfaces, electrical systems, food preparation areas, restrooms, ventilation, illumination, noise is sometimes an issue, air contaminants, structural integrity of the facility, and of course, fire protection. Um, just a reminder too that we get a written report from them. I usually have to follow up on anything that they state as a requirement. Here we also have in external in, um, hazardous materials, sorry, uh, is the last area. And there's another slide here. Here I'm talking about that we need to have strict and complete procedures concerning the handling and the storage and disposal of all of these items hazardous materials, bodily fluids, industrial strength, cleaning supplies, oil-based paints, fluorescent light bulbs, copiers. We might not think about on a regular basis, but they need to be treated in a special way because they are hazardous. And last of all, I just want to mention that um, there is an area that is coming, uh, becoming more of an issue, and that is the use of technology to provide services, especially during our COVID pandemic. I'm talking about things that look like telehealth or telepractice. Um, you need to make sure that you have written policies and procedures before providing this kind of training using technology. You need to make sure that there's consent forms confidentiality and privacy policies that, you know, like Dawn uh, did when we, she announced to everybody that this was being recorded uh, so that everybody's aware. And, and also areas around uh, infection control and emergency procedures. If you have somebody on the, uh, you know, the virtual modality that you're using and they indicate that there's an emergency happening in their home, what do you do about it? These are things that we have, you know, that are fairly new to a lot of organizations because they've switched from on-site to virtual without having real procedures and policies in place. So it's just a reminder to, you know, increase and as healthy as possible. So back to you, Don. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was, uh, there's so much that to cover. There's so much to cover when you're talking there's about this. And I hope that you know, all the participants, you know, as you're looking at these lists, there, there really is so much that goes into the day-to-day -day of keeping both staff and youth members safe. And so thank you, Sylvia, for going through um, to really highlight some areas that they need to be thinking about. Um, I know this is kind of, we have, uh, a little less than 10 minutes left, but we did want to be able to have um, questions for you. We did, I did see one in the chat um, from the Republic of Georgia that was really kind of asking, um, you know, how can they make trainings on these topics? Um, I, I think, you know, really, are there resources that they can take advantage of? Uh, how would they kind of create them on their own? What kind of recommendations do you have for them in that area? So I'm sorry, but I, I missed, you sort of crackled out on the very start of, of the question. Can you, can you just repeat the very beginning? First, for sure. Yeah, it's about the training component. Like if they were to try to make their own trainings for this, um, what recommendations do you have? Like how do, how do they go about doing that? 
Well, there there definitely are you know organizations out there that can provide a lot of the training. Um, a lot of people depend on what they can uh, search for online. It, it's very helpful. But also, uh, just a reminder: don't think that anybody has to reinvent the wheel in this area. There are modalities out there. There are courses out there. There's training out there. I have access to a lot of that through my affiliation with CARF International. Um, and I can provide that to whoever is interested. All they need to do is send me a quick email and uh, we can talk about exactly what you need, what's relevant to your area, because it's going to differ from country to country and location to location. And, you know, we can we can address that um, on an individual basis. Wonder, Sylvia. Thank you so much. We that this is one of the wonderful offerings of this particular session is that Sylvia has she knows that obviously there are many different situations for all of you across the world that that what um, what might apply in where one area may not apply in others. So she has made herself available if you would like to con connect with her and ask her a question that's really specific to your organization. Um, I know some of you are doing things virtually right now, right? So what are some procedures you need to have in place for that? Um, some of you, obviously everybody's operating in, in a COVID mode and, and I know that so many uh, clubs have really specific procedures, safety precautions, distancing masks, those types of things that are happening um, because of COVID, but she's, she's more than um, willing to be able to offer advice, insights, uh, resources, but wanted to be able to have that kind of more tailored to your needs. So I don't know if we have um, others. We can certainly keep the chat uh, and the questions going. I know we are almost out of time, so I'm gonna do real quick here. Um, just so you know, I will send this information to you all via email after this. So you'll have um, Sylvia's email available uh, that you'll be able to click on for there. Just for wrapping up here, um, we do have, you will get, like I said, that follow-up email to include a survey about today. Um, it will include the link to this session so that you um, can view it again or share it with others. And like I said, we'll have um, Sylvia's contact info so you can reach out to her directly. We also, just a quick reminder before we go, do have the international conference um, coming up and that's March 1st through 3rd. So please check your email um, for information about that. It's gonna be wonderful three-day sessions. It's only two and a half hours each day. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy the topics and the inspirational speakers that they have there. And as always, you can email us at admin at wfyc.org if you have questions. So we will go ahead and um, say thank you for those of you who need to go. But if anybody has another couple of questions that they wanna put in the chat, they are welcome to do so. Well, I do have one other one, Sylvia, that we, if we can try to grab real quick before we have about three minutes left um, it, from, from Venezuela that says, we wanna offer happiness and values to children and that includes preventing problems and knowing how to handle accidents. So thank you for this informational work. She just wanted to say thank you for this. Yeah, and I just want a, a quick reminder to everyone, for those of you who are not familiar with CARF International, they're one of the largest accrediting bodies uh, in, in, well, internationally, so in the world. And I do have access to uh, surveyors or uh, who are uh, international, speak you know, many languages. So if you wanted to connect with someone, I, I'm sure that I can, uh, I can make that happen uh, for anyone who's interested in, in more information. Um, about health and safety or anything else. We can also like directly- I say, I, 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 go I'm ahead, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I keep saying, don't think you have to reinvent the wheel. It's all been done by somebody else before. All you have to do is modify it to your own personal use so I can help you get that. Wonderful. I was going to say, we'll send, we can definitely send the questions that were featured in these slides as well, right? The points um, that Sylvia made to from those particular topics of transportation, you know, biohazards, critical incidents, those types of things. We can send you that via email as well. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I'll give just one more minute here, but I want to thank you so much, Sylvia, for taking the time to do this today. I know it's such a critically important topic um, for so many of our affiliates. I think if there's anything that we have learned 
um, through through all things COVID is how very important it is on, of all of us coming together um, to keep kids and each other safe. And so um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and everyone, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.